I turned to the job in the natural history museum and when I came to the museum I was offered um, a choice I could either go and work in protozoa or parasitic worms and I was told that protozoans was the number one thing so I thought okay fine it then turned out that the chap in charge of parasitic worms or partly the parasitic worms that they brought in had got fed up with the um, male assistants he'd had and he wanted a lady for a change so there was a last minute swap so about a week before I was due to start, I found myself involved in parasitic worms, and I've never looked back from that one, basically. What is a parasite? I'll just work my way through these. What is a parasite? A parasite is something that lives in or on another animal. Okay? And everything in the world has parasitic worms. Every single thing, from a flea to an elephant. There isn't anything that doesn't have parasitic worms in, on, round, they're everywhere. Hmm? So the, one of my, uh, a talk I gave last week had a final slide that said, if parasites are so wonderful, why haven't they taken over the world? And the answer was they have, we just haven't noticed yet. It's true, they're everywhere. Linnaeus, yeah, Linnaeus, I couldn't tell you exactly which page he is during the Sistina Naturae, but he was responsible for two of the most popular and common parasitic worms that there are. In fact, I brought one with me. You can Afterwards, you can come and have a look at these. For some obscure reason, I'm always put on just before lunch. It happens on every talk I give. It's always just before lunch. I think it's some sort of plot. Um, but there are two very common worms called Aspis lumbricoides, which is the big human round worm. And another one called, you right there, another one called Enterobius, pinworm. And they are both described by Linnaeus. And there is an awful lot more species that are described by Linnaeus. So I think it's probably under vermes, which was the old term. All the worms were called vermes, and that was parasitic worms, earthworms, leeches, everything that used to be under vermes. But nowadays it's, it's all a lot more complicated. Complex is the life cycle. Some of them have the most incredible life cycles, and you wonder how on earth they ever managed <coughs> to get where they are today. Um, they have two, three intermediate hosts before they get where they want to. And I brought in something today which is mind-boggling, and it always causes a riot in the talks that I have, which is parasite mind control. The kids love this one, absolutely, especially over Halloween. They couldn't resist this. Basically, it means that a parasite, when it wants to get to its final host, can actually alter the behavior of the host that it's in in order to maximize its chances of getting where it wants to go. The one I've brought with me, which you can come and have a look at if you like, is a fish. It's a roach. And in that roach, there are two young tapeworms sticking out of it. And that roach has become infected by eating a small crustacean that has the larval stage of the parasite in it. And it's grown to those, they've grown to that stage in the roach, but the roach is not the final host. The final host is a fish eating bird. So you're looking at something like a cormorant or a gull. So the worm wants to get into a cormorant or a gull. So it alters the behavior of that fish to make it swim closer to the top of the water so that along comes a fish-eating bird and it will eat that fish rather than one that's not infected. And if you go to a pond somewhere in the summer, it's, it's full of sticklebacks, and there's quite a few sticklebacks around now. If you put your hand over the water on a sunny day, it cuts out the light. And most self-respecting sticklebacks will go whoosh like that and go and hide in the reef because they think it's a kingfisher or something after them. But some of them will just sit out and say, come on, eat me, because they're infected with a relative of that, of that tapeworm. And if you've ever, ever indulged in YouTube, and everybody nowadays seems to, you can find all sorts of examples on YouTube. You can find the voodoo snails, which are snails that are going up and down a tree trunk with their eye stalks flashing and rippling in different colors. That's because they're infected with a, a, a worm, which gets into the eye stalks and makes them flash to attract birds because it wants to get into the, the bird final host. There's the old dichrocelium in the ant, which is a tiny little fluke, which lives in the liver of, of cows and sheep. The eggs come out, they're eaten by a snail. Um, the next stage comes out of the snail, sits on the grass, and it attracts ants. And this little tiny parasite, and you can work out the size of it, 
migrates to the brain of the ant and makes that ant run up a blade of grass, clamp its jaws on the top and stay there because by being on the top of the grass, it's more likely to be eaten by the cow or the sheep. They're full of things like this. And if you're really desperate, there is a most wonderful piece of film on YouTube set to Spanish guitar music, which takes a bit of getting used to, of a cricket which goes up to a swimming pool and promptly commits suicide by throwing itself in. And that's because it's infected with a thing called a gordiid, an amatomorph, which is another type of parasitic worm. But that worm is actually free living in the adult stage. It lives in ponds and streams. So it's parasitic in the insect, and then it makes the insect seek out water. And where it wants to be is a pond or a stream. But of course, unfortunately, beggars can't be choosers, and the crickets tend to fall, or crickets can be almost any insect, tend to fall into things like dogs' drinking bowls, um, swimming pools and domestic water systems which is great fun because people turn their cold water tap on and a six inch long black worm suddenly swims out of the tap and starts swimming around in the sink and for some obscure reason and I can't understand why they panic I personally would be delighted as I seem to be the only person in the country that can identify them nowadays um, but as far as they're concerned they don't like it how many worms do you store at the museum well, I haven't counted every one, but at a rough estimate, about 600,000. Okay. It was half a million, but that was a long time ago, and I've done a lot since then. Um, it's about 600,000, and we keep them either in alcohol, like these, ethanol, or on slides. And I can't remember offhand how many slides there are, but it's an awful lot. Something like 25 slide cabinets full, something like that. How common are worms in people? Well, I can guarantee that everybody sitting in this room has had a parasitic worm at some stage. That usually makes people go, no, I haven't. No, 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 no. <laughs> yes, you have. Unless you're the, because you're 99.9%, I think it is, uh, people have had a, a little tiny pinworm called Enterobius, which was actually described by Linnaeus, do you believe? It's the commonest pinworm in the world. And everybody... And it's like head lice. It goes through primary schools, and if one child gets it, they all get it. Totally harmless, um, and it normally dies out without people even noticing, unless some little child goes and tells mum that she's got worms, in which case panic breaks out in all descriptions. It doesn't mean they're dirty or anything like that. It's just saying it's a head lice thing. It can cause fun and games. I get an awful lot of inquiries from all around the world, from zoos and vets and wildlife places and God knows what else. And not so long ago, I had an inquiry from London Zoo. And they were in a state of tiswals because their gorillas had pinworms. And the keepers were not happy about this. And they said, oh, can you confirm that this is pinworm, gorilla pinworm, etc., etc.? And is it infectious to humans because the keepers want to know, and etc., etc.? I said, all right. So I looked at it, identified them, and with great joy, rang up London Zoo the next day and said, um, yep, it's got pinworms. Oh, dear, no. There's just one thing. I said, it's the human pinworm, and the gorillas have caught it from the keepers. <laughs> I didn't go down all that terribly well, you know, but truth, you can tell the difference between the two species, and it was the human pinworm that the gorillas had got. I don't know how they sold that one. I imagine there were some very irritated keepers, keepers' wives, and keepers' children. Basically, you can just take a pill and it gets rid of it. No problem. Do they provide any benefits to society? That's a good one. Well, apart from providing me with a job, um, yes, in fact, because now there's quite a bit of interesting work going on, particularly in the USA, about using live parasitic worms to help in the treatment of various diseases. Um, if you can persuade a patient who's got asthma to swallow a particular larva of a worm, these worms will actually go into the lungs and clean up the mucus, which helps with the coughing okay, and the breathing. Mind you, have to persuade them to swallow live parasitic worms in the first place, but I think actually if you were in chronic asthma, you'd try anything. And the same thing occurs to people who suffer from colitis, which is this nasty disease that leaves you with very nasty inflamed patches and whatnot in your intestines. There's another worm which apparently, the Americans are working on it, there's another worm which apparently will clean it all up because it eats the bacteria and everything around it. Um, it's the same principle as people using maggots, again, nowadays, to clean wounds, leeches are coming back in. 
you know, we're going back. As, as more and more people are going off antibiotics and all the rest of it, so they're resorting to the old treatments again. Could you give us an example of a beautiful parasite? They all are. There isn't. The public may disagree, but I think they're all beautiful. There is one, actually, that I'm sure that if you get in the swim bladder of fish, that makes me go a bit youth when I see it. But they're all beautiful, and I will show you a beautiful one in a moment. What is my favorite parasite? Oh, that's easy. That's Eric. Um, Eric is a tapeworm. I didn't bring him with me because he's too big. He is in a jar like this like this, and he's about seven meters long. I say he, and I should say it, because they're the matter. Uh, Eric, the tapeworm, and I have been just about everywhere together. We've been to sort of functions. We've been on every television station, every radio station, just about everything. So Eric is definitely, I don't know why it's called Eric. Its proper name is Diplobophrium polyrugosum, but it's quite a mouthful. It came from a killer whale stranded in the coast. In fact, I've got a picture of Eric on here in a minute. Um, and it's one of the biggest tape ones we have. But it's not the biggest by any means. And what usually makes people jump is when I tell them that there's a relative of this one. Same genus, different species, gets into humans, bigger. Gets on to 20, 30 meters in length in humans. And <laughs> One of my phrases, which my boss used in a radio interview I heard the other day, and I will sue him when he gets back from America, is my favorite phrase, which is, we can put you off eating absolutely anything in the world. We're great at parties. We can go around and say, I wouldn't eat that if I were you. I don't know. Works a treat. But I will show you some of the worms, providing this is working properly. I hope it is. It might take a little while to fire up. That's just a picture gallery, right? But I will go through to these individually. Um, that may seem a strange looking slide, but what that is actually, the thing marked A, this is just an example of the sort of inquiries that we get and the fun and games it can cause. That thing marked A, and it's not a particularly good picture because it wasn't a particularly good specimen, is a fluke, okay? A trematode, a digenium, call it what you like. And that actually comes from the kidneys of a bird, but it's a bird of paradise. And the bird of paradise was in captivity at Chester Zoo. And unusually for parasites, it killed the bird of paradise at Chester Zoo. As you can see the gruesome post-mortem bits at the bottom. I, I don't know quite what the vet was playing at, but apparently that shows inflamed kidneys and God knows what else. This was a puzzle because this bird of paradise, unfortunately, was the only red bird of paradise in Europe. And it had been in quarantine in Germany and in America. And it had been fine for months. And then suddenly, they, they put it out in this beautiful new tropical house that they built. And within a few weeks, it keeled over and died. Which, for a place like Chester, which is conservationally minded, was a bit of a disaster. And when they post-mortemed it, the kidneys were all inflamed, and they were absolutely full of these worms. And we could tell by the stage of the worm that they'd picked it up in the zoo. There was no way it had been sitting around for 10 years or whatever it was in Germany and America. This was new. And this caused a riot, and I was really popular with the keepers at Chester as I asked them to try and find the snail intermediate host, because we knew snails was the intermediate host. They turned the place upside down trying to find snails and kept saying, no, nope, there aren't any snails, there aren't any snails. And then somebody noticed a little tiny snail that was actually in the axles of one of the plants that were decorating the tropical house. And when they started looking properly, they found there were quite a lot of snails in these little axles. And these plants have been imported from Italy to decorate the house. And we think they brought the parasite with them. And what's happening now is that there's various molecular studies and things going on because this parasite is only supposed to be found in guinea fowl in Brazil. So what the heck it's doing in a red bird of paradise in Chester is anybody's guess. So there's all sorts of fun and games going on now to try and identify it properly. And there's molecular studies going on to see if everything is all the same species and heaven knows what else. But it's unusual for a parasite to kill its host because it does it kills itself, which is a stupid lifestyle. But of course, the worry now is, have some of the snails got out? Um, is this um, a European parasite that's come in? Or is this a Brazilian one? And why is it in a bird of paradise? And then somebody threw us a curveball last week by sending us some in from parrots in Costa Rica. And it's the same thing. So I, we're trying to work out what's going on. That's how we keep most of our specimens in alcohol. 
that's an interesting selection. Some of them I've brought with me, so you can have a look. <laughs> Anybody like here like sushi? Yeah, okay, fine. <coughs> the end of that conversation. Right. When I spoke about life cycles, there is a worm, and this is it, okay, called Anisakis simplex. That it's called Anisakis simplex species complex since the DNA boys got at it. It used to be just called Anisakis simplex, but now it's um, more complicated. It's a perfectly happy little worm. It goes in, it lives in dolphins and porpoises and whales and occasionally seals. And the life cycle is quite simple. The eggs come out of that. They're eaten by a little crustacean. The crustacean is eaten by any marine fish. Herrings used to be popular, but any marine fish will do. It insists in the marine fish, and then the marine fish gets eaten by the dolphin, porpoise, whatever, and the life cycle is complete, and everybody's happy. But if a human comes along and eats raw fish, now, if the fish has been cooked or if it's been frozen, and believe me, most of the sushi that you eat nowadays, if you buy it from Marks and Spencer's or something like that, it's been frozen beforehand, so you're pretty safe. But if you eat fresh sushi. A good sushi chef would recognize it in a restaurant, but if you've got fresh fish and you make your own sort of thing. If you swallow one of those live larvae, and they're only about well, less than a centimeter long, it lands in your stomach and it's not stupid. It knows it's in the wrong host. I don't know how it does it, but it knows it's in the wrong host. So it does what any self-respecting worm would do and it decides to get out. And the only way it can get out is to try and bore a hole through the stomach wall, which is what it does, and gives you ulcers. And it's a well-known disease um, in Japan, for obvious reasons, in California, because there's a lot of sushi bars, um, in Holland, because although they have soft herrings, sometimes the vinegar isn't strong enough to kill them. So that's just quite popular. And in Spain, if any of you have ever eaten ceviche, the raw fish salad that they have in Spain, that's another good source of it. I personally am not all that keen on sushi, um, but live with it. It's a bit like the, um, I, I brought along, I think, one of the beef tapeworms, and everybody said to me, oh, I don't suppose you eat anything, do you? And I said, well, yeah, you have to, a bit. And there's something else I'll tell you about in a minute, which will give you a laugh. Um, this is just a series of, of, of pictures of what they like. That is actually a piece of crocodile skin and uh, I wouldn't touch a crocodile handbag with a barge, but people do. And crocodile farmers were really upset because that's actually the soft white skin that you get on the belly of a crocodile. And all their crocodiles were being, skins were being ruined because they had this. And obviously people like Victoria Beckham and whatnot do not want, oh, I think it's quite attractive, they don't want a worm cast bag. And it is in fact the result of a little tiny nematode, roundworm which gets into the skin of the crocodile, and it makes all these tracks all the way up like that. It took the Australians years to find it because you had to keep dissecting out and try and find it. And the worm itself is only two or three millimeters long, but it's very busy. Um, collecting, how do we collect our worms? Well, that's one way of doing it. And it's always a great source of joy that my ex-boss, now retired, who loves the hot weather, tans easily, adores the beach and sunshine, does that when it comes to collecting. And the other one, who burns if he so much as walks out in the sunshine, ends up there. He goes to the Great Barrier Reef every January. This is a source of some irritation when you're sitting there on a freezing cold wet January day and you get an email from him saying, gosh, it's really lovely out here today. I've been out collecting and we're having a barbecue tonight. I hasten to add the Australians are paying for it. Yeah. This is an example of how identifying parasites can cause great fun. That is a barley miner. Okay. And a very pretty bird it is too. It's very rare and endangered because it's only found on the island of Bali. And because it's so beautiful, it's a real target for the exotic bird trade. And consequently, lots of them have died and, and poached and heaven knows what else. So a Jersey Zoo. They've been trying to breed them for years. Uh, and they're very successful too. Lots of chicks. 
Unfortunately, the eggs hatched, so the chicks came out, and within a couple of days, well, perhaps a week, they were dead, which is not great for a breeding program. And when they post-mortem them, they were full of parasitic worms. And something's wrong somewhere, so guess who got them all? Um, and the problem was, when I looked at them, I found that there was this one, which is a thing called Singulimus trachea, and there was this one, which is a toad worm. And these are all parasites of British birds, in particular starlings. Now, the barley minor, and this is the reason why we use the Latin names as much as we can, is a starling. It actually belongs to the starling family. And we discovered that what was happening was that the birds were breeding beautifully, but the mother birds were coming out from the nests and into the flight enclosure, and happily going down on the grass and pulling up the earthworms that were existing in the grass and in the soil and shoving them down the throats of their chicks. Well, this would be okay, except the wild starlings were sitting on the roof of the cage and their droppings were all going through and the intermediate host of all these parasites are earthworms. So what was happening was that the earthworms were getting loaded because it was such a restricted space. So instead of half a dozen larvae and eggs in one worm, there were sort of 50 or 100. So the poor little things were being overloaded. So we explained this, and Josie found a neat way out of it by putting polythene over the top of the flight cages so that the starling droppings couldn't go through. I know it worked because they said it had worked, and then about six months, eight years later, I got a postcard from Bali from one of the birds which said, Dear Eileen, thank you very much. You've solved our problems and we're now happily released and flying around in Bali. Love. And I thought that's the first time I've ever had a postcard from one of the clients, so to speak. As far as I know, it's still, still going extremely well. Parasitic worms come in all different forms, shapes and sizes. I know it looks like a rude photograph. That is an acanthocephalon. Okay? Acantho meaning spiny, cephalon meaning head, spiny-headed worms. And that proboscis thing you can see sticking out with all the spines on it is how they attach to their host. They're found in fish, reptiles, mammals, occasionally man, but um, normally fish are the most popular host for those, and birds. Um, they're a great joy to identify because one of the things you use to identify them is you have to count all those hooks and count the number of rows, longwise and across. And you try doing it when the diagram that you're using is perfectly straight and the worms you've got, and you end up going hooks one, two, um, three, or is that four, uh, five, six, seven, eight. Then you look in the description, it says one to seven, or seven, oh, perfection. That's a tapeworm. And that is quite a vicious looking tapeworm. You can see that's got a double row of hooks, which they use to hang on to their hosts. That's an nematode, which is probably a new species, actually. Believe it or not, that's come out of a giant tortoise in the Galapagos Islands. Still working on that one. That's a thing called a monogenian. <coughs> um, that particular one is Australian. It's got hooks and suckers and God knows what else because it lives on the skin and the gills of fish. So it needs those to hook on. Looks like something out of Doctor Who, to be perfectly honest, but fine. That's what a typical fluke looks like when it's stained and mounted. That's what a tapeworm looks like when it's stained and mounted. And to identify them, you literally have to count all these little bits and pieces. There's a couple of free living ones. We're also responsible for these. And these are little free living flatworms. They're British ones, actually. And for the gardeners amongst you, like me, they're very handy because they eat slugs. So if you have any, see any of these in your garden, don't tread on them because they, they do a really good job at getting rid of slugs. This is a monogenian. That's an SEM picture, scanning electron microscope picture. So you can see how tiny it is. Okay. And it's probably one of the most dangerous parasites of the whole lot because that little tiny thing is responsible for the death of God knows how many fish in Scandinavia. It's called Gyrodactylus, and the reason it's such a pain in the neck, as far as fish are concerned, it lives on the gills and the skin of salmon. And it reproduces at a horrific rate because it does it by the Russian doll principle. 
So inside that little tiny worm is another worm, and inside that is another worm, and another worm, and we go on to five generations, I think it is. So if you get it in the wild, it's bad enough, but you get that in a salmon farm, where the salmon are all kept in cages next to each other, it spreads like wildfire. And we've actually got specimens of young salmon in the museum collection, which look like they're wearing a fur coat, and it's because they are covered in this. And of course, eventually it suffocates them, because they, they all have to have a bit of space on the gills and skin, and the fish just suffocate. They've got no, no left to breathe. Anybody know what that is? I think one person does in this. That is Dracunculus medinensis, okay? One of the human worms. Um, that particular one, people would get from drinking dirty water, which is why you see the adverts asking people to donate to provide clean drinking water because the larval forms of this is in little tiny crustaceans, and if you swallow it, it grows into a lovely worm, which is about that long, and it lives under the skin. And the natives who get infected with it know all about it, and the way they get rid of it is to, they feel it moving under the skin, so they make a cut in the skin. They stick a matchstick under it, and they gradually wind it out. Each day, they wind it a bit more, and a bit more, and a bit more, until it's gone completely. They don't want to break it, because it might infect the wound and all the rest of it. But it's one of the few tropical diseases which hopefully is now on the way out. At least the incidence has been reduced by something quite fantastic now, simply by providing clean drinking water. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a free living flatworm. And the poor chap collected from London Zoo collected it in Bolivia, and he couldn't believe the size of it. Um, it's a free-living flatworm, and these free-living flatworms, we get them in this country, but not that size, um, are basically the ancestors of all the parasitic worms that we have. That's another new species from the bird of paradise, which I will get around to describing one of these days. When you have to do a post-mortem to collect your worms, uh, sometimes the problem can be a bit large. And the museum looks at all the stranded whales and dolphins on the British coast, of which there are about a thousand. Most of them are not this size. Um, that's a minky whale, I believe, that stranded on the coast not so long ago. And some brave soul gets in to collect the parasites from it. And you get them by the bucket load. The ones on the left, as you're looking at it, are from the lungs. The one in the middle is a piece of stomach with all the campicathlons attached to it. And the one on the right is a bucket full of tapeworm, literally. That too has anisakis, but a slightly bigger version. You can see by the size of it. Another reason for not eating the swishing. And those are, are ones from the lungs. And we had dolphins that had parasites in their lungs, stomach, um, heart, intestines, under the skin, kidneys, pancreas, everything. And they're perfectly fine, apart from the fact they were dead. But that was because they'd been caught in fishing nets. If the parasite's got its own niche and the animal's well fed, parasites aren't going to affect it in any way. That's one from the Black Sea dolphin. That's what would be called parasites and naughty bits. Basically, you have to, it's a bit chauvinistic, but if you try and identify roundworms, as I have to, you can only use a male. Females are regarded as useless because the males have all the characters on them. And those spicule type, those brown things, what are called spicules, is all part of their reproductive system. But you have to measure them and look at the structure and God knows what else. You can't do it just by holding them up. Some of them get to quite a size. This is Crassicorda, one of the biggest nematodes that there is, again from Wales. Um, you can see that's a 12-inch ruler, so you can see how big it is. They can cause some damage. As you can see, the, the one on the right, these are dolphin skulls from South Africa, and the one on the right has got lots of holes. And originally, that was thought to be due to deep diving, which is a bit strange, but it's not, in fact. It's due to a nematode because there's a nematode, a roundworm, that gets into the sinuses. And after a while, it gets a bit crowded in there because it's bony and there's no way out. So it bores its way through the bone. How it does it, I don't know, chemically, I imagine. And gradually, it just infects the whole thing. But it just bores, it, it can literally dissolve the bone. That's the killer whale that Eric came from. And that's the buckets of tapeworms that we got from the son of Eric, uh, son of killer whale. We only got one, that's why Eric was so large. That is actually a bit of Eric. 
as I said, I couldn't bring it with me because it was too heavy. But that's just a bit of Eric. And that's an example of how things can be rather clever. The thing on the right is a tumour, actually. It's taken out of the stomach of a, pulpit, a dolphin. And these tumours had been there for years. And for some reason, nobody had ever thought of chopping them up. But somebody eventually did and discovered a fluke inside. It's a thing called follicle. And what it does is it, it gets into the dolphin, lands in the stomach, and the host reacts to it by laying down a layer of tissue, host tissue. So the poor little fluke is sitting in there and it can't get its eggs out or anything like that. So what it does, it, it's a chemical. And this chemical dissolves a bit of the host tissue, making a thing like a chimney, so all the eggs can carry on getting out. So the host puts another layer of tissue down and it goes up a bit more. And this goes on and on and on until eventually the host wins. And it, it just lays down so much tissue that it can't, can't get through. And more acanthocephalus, quite a lot of them. And that's a piece of pilot whale. Every single pilot whale of a hundred had its stomach absolutely full of these, but they only stranded. It was nothing to do with the parasite. The last two bits, somebody asked me for a beautiful parasite. Well, that's my idea of a beautiful parasite, actually. That's a tapeworm. It doesn't look like one, but that is a tapeworm. And it's actually very pretty. It's got all these um, four spiny proboscis things that come out. And to identify them, and I'm glad I don't have to do it, you have to count all the hooks of those and cut the shapes. But I think they're beautiful. And the last slide is just to illustrate that not everybody thinks of parasites the same way as I suspect some of you do. That is a native of Papua New Guinea. He has killed a cuscus. Frankly, I'd rather keep the cuscus, but it's his lunch. So he's killed a cuscus. And when he gutted it, he found it was full of tapeworms. So I imagine a lot of people would chuck them away. <laughs> With my luck, they'd probably send them to me. Um, but in fact, he's eating it. It's a snack. It's crisps. It's vermicelli. It's tasty because he knows that that cannot infect him in any way because that particular tapeworm has to go through another intermediate host that's not infected. But he, he doesn't see it the same way. He just sees it as an extra. So he eats it. Eskimos do the same thing. If they kill a seal and the seal's stomach is full of nematodes, they will eat them all. You know? We tried it once when, when we had a, a social thing. We put a whole lot out in a dish, but strangely enough, nobody... They all went past and went, no thanks. I can't imagine why, but you know, why not? They know from experience that it won't hurt them in any way. So frankly, all I can say is, if you find any parasites, send them in to me. Um, a talk I gave in Bristol recently, my last slide said, for the British Wildlife Council, my last slide said, whatever your terms, we want your worms. Right. On reflection, I think that might have been a mistake. Because that was on the Saturday, and by Wednesday, I could hardly get in my room for parcels, packets, envelopes, which is wonderful. I wanted the material, but now I'm getting the email saying, did it arrive? Have you had a look at it yet? What is it? Oh, God. Okay. So, yes. So, as I say, whatever your terms, we want your worms. Okay.